His Excellency Mr. Bruce Gosper, Australian High Commission to Singapore, Mr. Bill Twirrell, Chancellor James Cook University, Mr. Cam Charlton, Deputy Chancellor James Cook University, Professor Sandra Haring, OA, Vice Chancellor and President James Cook University, distinguished guests, students, ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon. My name is Abhishek Bhatti, and on behalf of my fellow collaborators on this project, I welcome you to the launch event of the report on the effects of overseas business expansion on firm performance, evidence from Australia. This project is funded by the Pratt Foundation Australia. In the recent years, Australian businesses have expanded their operations into Asia and beyond for a variety of reasons, which may include broader market, lower cost of production, distribution opportunities, diversification of the business, and to manage employment in terms of skills and costs. Conventional wisdom would think that when Australian company moves overseas, or some of the operations overseas, then it reduces employment in Australia and increases employment elsewhere. In situations where the firm expands operations overseas, it may well be due to its reduced or lost competitiveness in the home market. The reduced or lost competitiveness can lead to employment loss in home if the business significantly scales down or completely closes its operation. However, consideration needs to be given to the fact that the company could be entering a market of some 7 billion people worldwide, which may in fact increase its competitiveness. The growth in Asian markets could have positive impact on the organization growth and available jobs in Australia. As such, the decision to expand overseas may be instrumental in regaining competitiveness and hence in protecting jobs in Australia. When an enterprise expands their business overseas, they may result in increased demand for the firm's shared services. If such shared services are based within Australia, then additional employment to support shared services will be created at home. The answer to the question as to whether Australian business expansion into Asia and beyond is good or bad for home employment is thus of great practical significance for businesses and government policymakers. If it can be verified that Australia's business expansion is likely to have positive effect on home business outcomes such as profitability and employment that is increasing employment within Australia or at least not imposing negative impact on home employment, then overseas business expansion can become a useful approach to boost Australia's future economic wealth and needs to be promoted by governments and employee groups alike. A group of researchers at James Cook University empirically examine how Australia overseas activities may affect home employment and business outcomes in Australia. The study is expected to generate insights into the impact of international business expansion on jobs in Australia, as well as have valuable implication for industry development and government policy initiatives. Today's program include a report launch, a summary of the report, and a panel discussion on overseas business expansion and firm performance. So without any further ado, I would like to call upon Mr. Jonathan Glickfield, General Manager of VISI, to deliver the welcome speech. Thanks, Abhishek. Um, His Excellency, Mr. Bruce Gosper, Australian High Commissioner, Mr. Bill Tweddle, uh, Chancellor of James Cook University, Mr. Cam Charlton, uh, who's the Deputy Chancellor, and Professor Sandra Harding, the Vice-Chancellor and President of JCU. Uh, welcome to the launch of the JCU report into the effect of overseas expa expansion on firm performance. I must admit, when I convinced the Pratt Foundation to undertake this study in 2015, I had visions of obtaining an expert in international relations or economics, a keynote speaker of the ilk of Parag Khanna or uh, Kishoro Marabeni. And even though I enthusiastically and respectfully uh, contacted Parag, I learned how branding doesn't have the same pull as this week's Doha debates or Harvard University speaking opportunity. Nonetheless, I'll channel his ideas in the spirit of the fine Asian tradition of imitation as the surest road to mastery. 
I want to spend a few moments talking about the context of this study and why it was undertaken. Here are the obvious facts as Parakana would present them. Australia's annual growth rate is 2% and negative without immigration. Global middle class cons consumption will amount to $30 trillion between 2015 and 2030. But only one trillion of that middle class consumption growth is in the West. A rational assessment of those two figures, a trillion dollars of growth in the West, $29 trillion in the East, dictates that the decision to expand overseas and probably to Asia is not a choice, but a necessity. So if the data is telling us to trade, to move, to expand elsewhere, why do we Australia Inc struggle with a national push to act in our own rational interest? In 2015, when this study was, was conceptualised, I thought the reason was a societal fear that overseas expansion costs domestic jobs making private sector motivation lower than it should be and government support electorally unpalatable. I couldn't empirically prove that the fear exists, but my own nose for the zeitgeist and exposure to the factory floor told me that multi-levels of Australian society, from the unions to boardrooms, even the professions, are hesitant to expand offshore for fear of a negative effect on domestic performance and especially employment. This in spite of international research indicating that overseas expansion at the of the right type actually protects jobs on the home front. Simply, if the research conducted in an Australian context indicated that overseas expansion has positive effects on firm performance and no negative effects on employment, then government and private sector support for global expansion would, would, would grow. I'll now refer to one more of Parakana's ideas. This JCU study, however it is critiqued, is a technocratic study. The best performing societies today are run by governments that are not driven by ideologies, but by technocratic policy development. The best performance, performing governments today make decisions based on research, data and facts to produce pragmatic outcomes. Technocracies understand the difference between politics and policy, the former being about positions and the latter decisions. The great challenge is to protect the D in democracy while growing the T in technocracy. Parag Khanna will tell you in today's world there, there are few if any big D democracies that are successful technocracies. There lies the challenge for Australia to invest in more studies like this use the information rationally and become the first big D democracy that delivers the societal benefits of technocratic thought. I'd like to thank Dale Anderson for encouraging me to pursue this study, Annette Tilbrook for sending out the first surveys through Auscham three years ago, Abhishek Bharti and Pinky Sibyl for all of JCU's current support, Kate Baldock for throwing Auscham's weight behind today's launch, the Pratt Foundation, the Pratt family and Sam Lipsky for investing in academic research, which they rarely do. And above all the academics, Dr. Hongbo Liu, Dr. Rabil Beg, Associate Professor Zi Jong Sun, Professor Zhang Wei Jiao and Associate Professor Abhishek Bharti, who gets two mentions, uh, for this and for generally holding a torch to thought in Australian society. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, especially for the double mention. I would like to call upon His Excellency Mr. Bruce Gosper, Australian High Commissioner to Singapore, and uh, Chancellor Bill Tudel to come up and, and please uh, uh, inaugurate and launch the report, please. Um, Jonathan, do you want to join them, please? Thank you, High Commissioner and Chancellor. Copies of the report is available at the reception and even at the back of this room. It will be available on JOC website as well for easy access in the future. This project has been a joint effort of researchers across James Cook University's campuses in Australia and in Singapore. And on behalf of the research team, Associate Professor Si Jo Sung will present the report summary. Please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Santos there. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, 
and one of the teams, as Abhishek introduced. Uh, basically, what we did here is we look at uh, how uh, firms uh, overseas business expansion, how does this affect their performance back in the home market? Summarize in one sentence. Um, well, I guess all we agree is, is that Australia is an open economy, which means many firms there, they are actively engaged in overseas business operations. And actually, we can look at this from two perspectives. One is the kind of output perspectives. So firms, they produce output, they sell it overseas. Okay, so this output perspective. We can also look at the uh, input perspectives. Uh, they import intermediate inputs, produce it, export it. Or they invest, they go to a, f a foreign market to invest, uh, to, to, to maybe procure uh, intermediate inputs, uh, labels, all sorts of uh, transactions there. Uh, so conceptually, one will expect that uh, such kind of overseas uh, business uh, operations might affect the domestic performance, okay, conceptually, and we need proof, actually. And that's what we are doing here. Uh, so this report intends to empirically explore whether Australian business, the overseas uh, expansions, affect their perform performance in terms of three aspects. Certainly there are more than three, but we focus on three. First, the demand for domestic workers, both casual and uh, full-time workers as well. And the size, revenue. How will this uh, promote the revenue growth and the profitability? Uh, we utilize data sets, uh, firm survey data sets uh, by APS. Okay. Uh, before that, let let's quickly look at some sort of aggregate pictures here. Uh, this one. Uh, is uh, Australia's exports and imports from 2001 to 2017. And we can see that there's, there's clearly, clearly there's uh, upward trending here. Uh, although there's uh, some sort of up down, up down, particularly here is because of financial uh, crisis. Okay. Um, in terms of export markets, uh, this is uh, 2001. Uh, oops. And this is uh, 2017. Compare this to a time period, we can see that the, the importance of Asia is actually increasing. Uh, but one note is China uh, jumped from six to number one, and all top one, two, three, except United States, they are all actually uh, located in Asia. So the importance of Asia. Uh, for the Australian business is quite clear here. Uh, look at, uh, in terms of products, uh, it clearly says that uh, Australia's comparative advantage in terms of mineral resources, in terms of uh, education, and that's what James Cook is good at, uh, in terms of uh, travel, tourism, tourism, uh, in terms of agriculture, so these are major items that Australian exports. Okay, um, so what we do here, I, I don't want to present you with so, all sorts of technical details, but summarize in one sentence, what we do here is we actually hypothesized the firm's performance is a function of overseas expansion and a set of other control variables. And then we use data to fit, to find out what this function is, to estimate the, the parameter of interest. And from there, we can actually uh, infer whether there's a positive impact, there's negative impact, or there's, there's no insignificant impact. Okay. Uh, a bit more about data. Uh, it is called Business long Longitudinal Database. Uh, it, which is publicly available on ABS website, actually. So collected by ABS, covers the time period from 2006 to 2010, 2011. Uh, it has over 3,000 Australian business over five years. Uh, 
this data actually uh, contains a lot of variations, which is good, which we need and technically to estimate, to write estimations. For example, uh, let's look at the number of workers, uh, which is a categorical variables. Say it takes, it takes one if a firm uh, employs less than five workers. Two is five to 10, three, 10 to 15, and four is bigger than 15. And, and on average, uh, this, this, this variable take a value of 2.6 with a standard deviation of 1.8 something. You can think this is a spread, how spread the data is. So, so, so there are data that we are able to ut utilize this variation to do the estimation. For the impulse, uh, again, it's captured by a set of dummy variables which take a one if a firm export between zero to almost uh, $10,000, so on and so forth, similar for exports. Well, in the estimation, we also conclude as include a set of control variables uh, which include productivities and a, dumb, a set of dummy variables that measure firms' innovation activities. Pers conceptually, this will affect firms' performance. Well, we don't want to uh, pick up a wrong impacts there. Um, and here's the fin findings uh, without any figures. So, for example, say in terms of exports, actually we, we find that generally it increased uh, firms employment of casual workers. Everything else being constant, control for other factors. What, you, you might be wondering what's, what's happening here. Well, single imports, we are import intermediate inputs. I want to, I'm the firm, I want to produce more. So certainly, I'm, I'm importing inter intermediate inputs, I need more workers to, to, to produce more output. So, so, so this actually is very consistent with our uh, uh, prior expectations, okay. In terms of export, it actually reduces reduce the firm's demand for, 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 work, for, for casual workers. Um, there's, there's one, there's a, economically, there's, a, there's a, a group of studies who find that, okay, firms can actually export, they learn from exporting and improve their productivities. And if the productivity improves, actually they are, they are, gonna, they are gonna have fewer workers, yeah, because they are more, they are more productive now. Uh, for contracting out the work, well, not surprisingly here, uh, regarding the employment of full-time workers, similarly, imports increased uh, the, uh, the employment of full-time workers. Uh, export actually reduced. Again, it's, it's more due to uh, learning by exporting, exporting uh, improved the productivities. People, uh, firms become more productive. Uh, it does not have any significant impact on the uh, contracting after work does not have any significant impact on the employment of full-time workers. Profitability as uh, import a negative effect, but only significant at 10 percent levels. Or, or you can do see think that the evidence is not that strong. Okay, uh, it does not uh, affect uh, export. Does not affect profitability and this contracting out work negatively affect profitability. And in terms of sales revenues, actually there's very strong gross effect there. Yeah. So, so this uh, overseas expansion, uh, one point I, that I, I can observe here is, or the data tell us is uh, there's a strong gross effect there. Okay. All right, uh, so a little bit of implication that we want to draw here is that um, overseas business activities, they are clearly important firms. And our empirical estimation also confirms the importance in terms of the impact on, on, on three aspects, uh, uh, workers, demand for workers, profitabilities, and the total sales revenue. Well, this, people might, might be thinking that, okay, we want, say, we want to measure impact of X to Y, they gotta be positive, negative, or no impact. And actually, from, I'm a researcher, I'm an economist, so I'm not, I, I'm gonna say what I have here. Actually, there's no clear cut. I cannot say exactly there's one, there's a positive impact or, is, or exactly the negative impact. So, so, so we want to 
be aware that actually uh, it can generate both positive and negative impacts on firm performance. Okay. Um, however, overall, one point that's worth of noting is that if we have negative impact, uh, for example, for example, we must okay. We contract out some works, then the demand for 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 workers might decrease in the short run. However, in the long run, there's there's, there's, there's a growth effect there. So 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 firm growth, they actually they they, they actually will will require more, you know, more workers. So we would like to say that. Uh, Given this, policy makers, they don't want to uh, discourage a firm's engagement of overseas uh, business, business activities, particularly even if, if, if there's a negative impact in the short run. They could be very likely that in the long run, there's gross effect like offset this. Okay. And that's what I want to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Sojang. Um, Sojang flew all the way up from Townsville to come and present for this report, so thank you again for making the effort. Of course, that was a quick summary, and the full details are available in the report, which is, of course, provided to you and that you can uh, download from the JCU website. The report launch would be incomplete without a robust discussion on overseas business expansion on firm performance. And I would like to call upon Dr. Jacob Wood Director of Center of International Trade and Business in Asia, SIDBA in short, to lead and moderate a panel of eminent panelists. Uh, good afternoon, every everyone. It's uh, nice to be here with you all uh, today. I think uh, probably the easiest way of, of doing this would be for me to start off by introducing our esteemed uh, panelists uh, for today, and then we can we can begin the uh, discussion. So I'd like to firstly introduce uh, Associate Professor uh, Ricardo uh, Walters. Uh, Associate Professor Ricardo Walters is an economist who received his doctorate from Maastricht University in the Netherlands. He specializes in the area of labor market economics. Before joining James Cook University, he completed a postdoctoral position at the University of Newcastle in Australia. Ricardo is the current head of the academic group Economics and Marketing at James Cook University. He also leads the research theme Sustainable Development at the Cairns Institute, GCU's Research Centre for Tropical Societies. It's great to have Ricardo here today. Secondly, His Excellency uh, Bruce Gosper, the High Commissioner, Australian High Commissioner to Singapore. Bruce Gosper was previously CEO of Austrade, the Australian government agency responsible for promoting trade, investment and international education and tourism policy programs and research. Prior to Austrade, Mr Gosper was Deputy Secretary with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and Australia's Senior Trade Policy Official, responsible for all trade negotiations. His career includes serving as Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the World Trade Organization in Geneva. During that time, Mr Gosper chaired the WTO General Council and the WTO Dispute Settlement Body. Mr. Gosper was previously Minister Commercial in the Australian Embassy in Washington and Minister Councillor Agriculture at the Australian Embassy in Tokyo. Mr. Gosper is a current member of the Asia Society Advisory Council. He has previously served on the Australia-Japan Business Cooperation Committee, the European-Australian Business Council, the Australian-Japan Foundation, the Australia-Korea Foundation, the Australian Port Corporation and the Export Finance and Insurance Corporation Board. So it's fantastic to have him here as well today. Thirdly, Ali Tian. Ali Tian is the co-founder and head of Ali's Basket, which is an online grocery that offers Singapore consumers direct access to a huge range of groceries, air flow and overnight direct from Australia to Singapore. Launching in February 2019, Ali's Basket provides access to a superior range of everyday products that are fresh, high quality, competitively priced and can be trusted. This includes everyday items from bread, milk and seafood through to fresh fruit and vegetables. Leveraging a proprietary e-commerce solution that is fully integrated with Australian suppliers and key logistics providers, they are successfully facilitating cross-border B2C trade and perishables. 
Ellie leads a small team of experienced, passionate entrepreneurs, technologists, and supply chain experts that are excited about disrupting the online grocery market in Asia. And finally, Ben Smith. Ben Smith is head of Australia New Zealand desk at ANZ Singapore. In his current role, Ben leads the management of relationships with ANZ's corporate and institutional customers from its home markets of Australia and New Zealand, who seek to leverage Singapore as a regional business hub and gateway to do business across the ASEAN region. Using ANZ's connection to its home markets and footprint across 15 markets in Asia, Ben also manages the relationships with investors from Singapore into Australia and New Zealand, helping them to identify and take advantage of business opportunities. He works in close collaboration with Singapore, Australian and New Zealand agencies to help facilitate trade and capital flows between these geographies. Ben's financial services experience covers the full spectrum of commercial and institutional banking in both developed and emerging markets. Ben has been with ANZ for over 14 years and has spent seven of those in Southeast Asia. He originally joined ANZ in Auckland before taking on a role in Cambodia before moving on to Singapore where he is now based. With his on the ground experience in ASEAN over the years, Ben has seen how businesses have from various industry sectors have succeeded at capturing the opportunities that this diverse and fast-moving region presents. So it's absolutely fantastic to have such a good panel, set of panellists here today and I, I hope that we can have a good robust discussion. So I'd now like to uh, welcome the panellists up to the, the front uh, of, the, of the room. Thank you very much Abhishek. Um, I think what, what I'll probably do is I'll stick to the, the set of questions here in the, in, the, in the beginning and then we can go uh, to the audience um, with questions towards, towards the end. But I've decided that I would uh, enter, uh, start today's uh, uh, discussion with some, some nice, a uh, couple of nice easy questions just to get the ball rolling. And I thought to do, to do that I would uh, address the first question to my, my friend and colleague uh, Ricardo uh, Welters. Um, and I think it's just uh, drawing upon, I guess, some of the uh, introduction that we just heard from Associate Professor Shizong Sun. And I'm just wondering if he could elaborate a little bit more on about the instances in which a do domestic firm would actually be wanting to expand its operations internationally. And uh, why do you think they engage in such practices? And in particular, what kinds of Australian businesses um, have been leading the way in this regard? So there's three questions in there. So. Uh, do you, would you, would you, would you like a mic? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, three questions, so I'll yeah. probably have to okay. come back to you once I've answered the first one. Um, just, just, just some background on the study. Um, I think th the main reason why we did the study, uh, or Jonathan wanted us to do the study, was, was to, to broaden or to provide some nuance around uh, OBE, yeah? so Overseas Business Expansion, because that discussion is very narrow. So let me give three examples of that. One, if, as soon as we talk about OBE uh, in Australia, uh, the discussion is about, oh, okay, this is shifting jobs from, one, from Australia to, to overseas, and, and, and that's where the, the, the analysis stops. And so we wanted to broaden that. Um, second is, you know, in the 24-hour news cycle that we have, um, if, if a company announces OBE, that it will do OBE, then the only thing that we, the media is interested in is the immediate effect and that might be a negative effect, but it's not interested in the longer term effects, uh, which are really important to actually address as well. And, uh, and the, third, the third point that I was thinking about, and I think that's really important, is, is as soon as we ask ourselves that question around um, should a, or why is a business uh, going overseas, um, I always try and, and, and turn that question on its head and, and, and look at the counterfactual, counterfactual and say, well, what would happen to that business if it didn't? Uh, if it didn't go overseas, um, if it wouldn't go overseas, it would forego this, this, this business opportunity. So it wouldn't be acting in the interest of the business. Now, if you do that, you will be underperforming. And if you're underperforming in the market, you'll probably be a, a, a takeover target. And, and you might think, oh, oh t takeover target, is that a big deal? Um, but it probably is, because I was looking at there was a, a news article in Australia, I think on Tuesday, and um, a researcher had looked at um, 
the, the ASX 100 companies, so the, the, the biggest 100 companies in Australia in 2007. So you make that list of 2007. And what they saw is that 33 of those 100 businesses were taken over by now. Uh, so that is a serious threat. Um, so to come back to your questions, what was the, qu the second question? Maybe the second question was why do you think they're engaging in such uh, practices? Because they have to. Mm. This, is, this, is, this is, I think, the point I'm trying to make. It is, if you look at the counterfactual, if you don't do it, you know, what's going to happen? That, that's a brutal market mm. out there. Uh, if you don't do it and you get taken over, what do you think the new owners are going to do? Right. Well, they are going to do it. You know? So I think you have to, to, mm. uh, to engage in that mm. if you want to survive. Are there any particular industries in, you know, in particular where businesses are really pushing ahead in that regard? Yeah. Um, industries, it started, I think, with the, um, the financial services industry. That's where it started. But it has broadened out now. I, was, I, I saw a report on, uh, from um, Aust Chambers yeah. uh, in Singapore. And um, yes, financial services, that's still a big, a big industry. But now there's also... Uh, property development, construction industries are, are picking up, and professional services industries are also big in this area. So those are the three main industries uh, which are conducting OBEs. Okay. okay, very good. Um, I guess building on, on, on this question, uh, you've, you've already alluded to it uh, in terms of financial services. Uh, ben, you work at the ANZ. You've obviously got a very important uh, role to play in facilitating the movement of business from domestic and international marketplaces. So I was just wondering if you could sort of elaborate and exp uh, explain t to everyone here about what you've been trying to do to facilitate that sort of uh, progress, in particular some of the products that you've been offering, et cetera. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, just firstly I'd say um, congratulations to JCU and Pratt Foundation and Jonathan. Uh, quite an interesting uh, study and we try to look at this topic in similar ways, although we've not focused, we've made the assumption that jobs is not an issue, that the outward expansion is positive in the, the studies that we've done over the last five years, which we call Opportunity Asia, uh, with the 2019 one to, to report later this month, um, you know, are off the premise that this is a, a positive opportunity and the, and the other thing. So it's, it's in, it was interesting to see that debate in your report. Um, and the results of that, you know, uh, later this month, you'll see uh, around 50% of those Australian businesses that we survey make more uh, higher profit in Asia than they do from their Australian business, which is, to me, quite a remarkable statistic and not necessarily what people perceive it as the opportunity expanding here. Uh, many of them have been doing it for a while. Um, it's generally taking about three years to, to get a return on investment, so it does have, and, and it does, and 40% of them are spending a lot more than, than they initially uh, budgeted. Um, and so back to your, your question, financial services I think stands out in the study as the, as the biggest industry. That is perhaps a little bit misleading in that our um, product is money, so the numbers get big very easily. <coughs> and there's, uh, I guess, small, and you know, there's a, there's a smaller number of very large institutions in Australia that have expanded out over a very long period of time. Um, I see manufacturing and mining was there. I mean, mining's there because Australia is a world leading, I think, a world leader in that industry. Manufacturing seems to have dropped off and, and plateaued. Um, we see opportunities in other sectors, and so we're actively trying to promote that. So, you know, banking services is only an outcome of expansion. So having a network like us, we'd like to see more businesses expanding and help be that bridge between making it easy um, in terms of knowing who you are and how you, not having to explain yourself to a different organisation in each market, et cetera, et cetera. And so you know, what we see when the companies are expanding, when they do it successfully, is they're not trying to duplicate and replicate everything they already have. They uh, most likely, when they're expanding to a place like Singapore, going with the sales and marketing office first and using their infrastructure that already exists in the finance, the HR, the leadership, I guess, and, and um, if there's manufacturing and physical production behind it, keeping that in Australia. Uh, and that, that means that you're hopefully not overcapitalizing, the risk is a bit less, uh, the continuation of the culture of the business um, can be progressive and yet you have more optionality, I guess, to that. What, are, what do you think then are some of the, 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 the key concerns that the business owners are coming to the bank and you with, and what are they wanting support for in particular? So 
in this region, they're most concerned about not understanding the markets being, you know, um, charging ahead with um, without enough information behind them, you know, making the same mistakes someone else has made before, all that kind of thing. So for us, you know, and there's plenty of parties in this room, help play a role in sharing the experiences that we've seen before or connect, connecting to people that have done it before. I think, and that's where Singapore plays a key role in Southeast Asia, is there's always someone here that's done what you want to do before. Mm -hmm. And there's typically people that have worked for other organisations that have a similar product or strategy or market entry um, desire to you. And you don't necessarily have to solve from scratch, you can tap into that. But knowing who to talk to and getting that advice mm. is, the, is sort of the key to getting the, f the first step on the runway. You know, my background's in trade, in economics and trade, and a lot of the things I look at are some of the technical requirements, the regulatory requirements that companies need to overcome in order to get into the marketplace. You know, the likes of uh, non-tariff barriers, those kinds of protectionist things. A lot of businesses are coming across the difficulties associated with the regulatory technical requirements in, in Asia, a lot of the yeah. emerging markets? Um, I think the answers to that, unfortunately, we're not a great <laughs> yeah. help there. It's, um, but it, that's, um, that help is there, you know, whether it's via Austrade or others. Mm -hmm. We've developed an online tool where you can search your, um, you know, your free trade agreement op options. That's in that ANZ, ANZ Be Ready, is that what ready, it's yeah. called? As a plug for ANZ yeah, there. It's not up on the <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, you know, I think I'd go back to that someone else that's done it before that can give you the advice. It's very hard to systemise that without tapping into the relationships and people with knowledge. Particularly, as it's not a s steady state. You know, these non-trade, uh, non-tariff barriers, um, and just generally in this region, it's quite dynamic what changes, how welcome business is one day and how unwelcome it might be the next. You know, Malaysia's a m much more difficult place to enter now and it was before the change of government, mm -hmm. because the you know the policy settings are changing, and the and the and and that can happen in every three months rather than every three years kind of thing. So it, it has to be dynamic. Okay, okay, and I guess um, just as a, a final follow up uh, question, um, the research by NZ shows that more than half of business exporters to use uh, utilize a hub. And I wanted to talk about this hub and maybe lead into a, qu a question I'm going to ask Bruce later. But um, a lot of them have been moving uh, away uh, from, from your research from Singapore to Hong Kong. And I'm just curious as to what your uh, thoughts are on you know, hubs in Asia and, and some of the, ge the geopolitical influences that are yeah. happening in the region at, at present. Yeah, so I think that um, the bit you're grabbing there is around logistics hubs. Mm. Um, so I think that's a reflection of, you know, Singapore was the largest port in the world until three, four years ago. Shanghai is now the largest. So just that volume of trade coming out of China. Conversely, hubbing of business regional headquarters um, uh, leadership functions is actually, I think, moving more to Singapore. Some of the challenges that you see in a place like Hong Kong at the moment is only driving more regional businesses here. The output of that is that, um, I think, in the context of Australian business, Australian businesses generally see themselves as either the start of something, so an export-driven market, or the end of something, an import-driven market. Mm -hmm. The concept of using a hub to run your business so you've got a more efficient and connected um, platform is a little bit foreign until you come to a place like Singapore, and it can be Hong Kong, and it could be Bangkok, it could even be KL or yep. um, Mumbai, perhaps. Uh, until you start tapping into that and you see the efficiencies that happen and then the networks that you can create, that that it's sort of just a foreign concept. So people have got to get out and see it and we help try and, and market that. I think the other thing is that hub plays a role not just in mainly export driven and for Australian companies we see it in a lot of cases on procurement. So getting out of onshore Australia and into Singapore where the multinationals have more senior leaders and decision makers has enabled a number of Australian companies to get closer to a higher level of management, a better negotiating position, and a global pricing sheet as opposed to a ring-fenced mm. Australian pricing sheet. Okay. Very good. I think, uh, obviously, the banking uh, sector plays a very important role, but government uh, also uh, is very important in, in, the, in this discussion. So I'd like to sort of now look at maybe what the government, the Australian government's been trying to do to facilitate uh, the movement of small business 
uh, business in general into uh, global markets, the Asia market in particular. Maybe if, you, if we could just start off by um, you explaining, Bruce, about what some of the initiatives have been by uh, the Australian government in that regard. Sure, thanks Jacob. Um, well generally the best thing government can do is get out of the way um, <laughs> or, or, or not be a problem. Um, but the government is trying to encourage certain things and Singapore provides us with a bit of a solution. I mean the problem with offshoring is basically that we don't have enough of it. You know we've got a very satisfactory domestic market uh, and, and a lot of companies do quite well in that but we know enough now about the way technology is moving, global supply chains are moving, um, economies in the region are growing, to know that that's not sufficient if we actually want to maintain living standards at the current level. We need boosts in, in the size of market, we need more innovation, we need productivity growth. And generally that's not going to come uh, in a sufficient sense from inside the country. So we haven't seen much growth in exports, in exporters, over the last um, decade or two. You know, we've got about 55,000 exporters. Um, about 1% of them account for about 90% of exports. Mm -hmm. So what, what we're talking about here is SMEs, and we want to help SMEs become MEs, or even bigger. Um, and what a lot of the academic literature tells us, of course, is that um, if you want to grow, often the opportunities offshore, exporters tend to find innovation if they're faced with stronger competition in a, in a bigger market and a more competitive market. Innovative companies sometimes find exports, but the bigger point to make is how exporters tend to have innovation forced on them <coughs> and embrace them. And that's exactly what we need. So a big part of what we've been trying to do here in Singapore over the last couple of years is to do two things. One is to bring more Australian companies here to get an insight into Singapore and the region and take advantage of all the assets that Singapore has established here, which is basically as an outward looking, very open, entrepot, uh, hub economy. So um, English language, a common law legal system that allows enforceable contracts, the absence of corruption, um, then the fact that it's built together, these twin pillars of a manufacturing industry which is highly efficient and mechanised and automated, and the attraction of multinational corporations. So the 4,000 odd multinational corporations that run regional and global procurement decisions and global supply chains and the investment decisions and the sourcing of technology and inputs uh, as part of that. Uh, and then lastly, of course, uh, this place is a, a hub for capital. The fact that you've got so many banks here, um, all that capital from places like Indonesia, India, China and elsewhere comes here to take advantage of all those things I've described, plus the presence of professional services so people who look at the region, look at opportunity, and look at how they bring people together. Um, and then we marry that with the innovation ecosystem that's being created here. Now, it's a two-way thing. We encourage Singaporeans to come to Australia because we're pretty good at a lot of science and innovation and, and skilling, of course. But we get, we get much more bang for our buck if we come here and put, put firms in, a, in an environment where they can see what the opportunity is and get the right sort of collaboration because the world now really does rely on your partners as a, as a route to getting the capital, to getting the markets and the customers that you actually need. And you get a position in a supply chain, you get a good partner to access a, a new market. And there's plenty of examples of people who are doing that. The best one I like to talk about recently is a, a firm called Icon, um, who invested in here in, um, in some cancer oncology um, clinics and is now looking at consolidating here with compounding and radiography um, and uh, diagnostic services and branching out building capability in China and Vietnam and elsewhere. So plenty of those sorts of examples. Now no doubt there, is a, there are political and policy problems um, for people to be aware of, and maybe you want to come back to them later, but, but the biggest problem that we face is 
getting Australian companies to embrace the higher risk and the higher rewards of this environment that we have here in this region. Yeah, you mentioned, I was going to ask you just before, you mentioned there's been, uh, hasn't been strong growth in export numbers coming out of Australia. I mean, wh why do you think is that, why is that the case? What are some of the factors do you think that are restricting Australian businesses from, from taking that step? Is well, it a policy thing or...? Uh, yeah, there's probably a mix of things there. I mean, uh, we've been growing for 27 years. People can make decent returns in the market, there's no doubt. There's also a conservatism mm. that seems to be built into the system. I mean, and there's plenty of reports that validate and uh, expose this um, about the lack of appetite for um, riskier environments, the, the longer period it takes to get a return, the greater deal of uncertainty about political and um, and uh, and similar problems in in some markets here and and there's no doubt it's um, it's uh, uh, an environment where you know you will have to invest more time mm -hmm. and probably more money in building um, something but but there are plenty of people who've done it I mean one of the things that strikes me in Australia people talk about um, Australians not being Asia literate. And I sort of scratch my head about that because if you here in Singapore you see plenty of people, Blue Scope would be one example, you know, they global they've got a global position, they do very good things in a lot of very difficult markets uh, and they invest in the local workforce. It works well. You see people like Len Lease, who are now part of the furniture here and operate from here, building aged care in China. All that all that sort of stuff. They're sort of fantastic examples. You don't see the growth. But then the, the, the thing that strikes me is there's Australians everywhere in this place. You know, they're, they're in the multinational corporations, they're in the institutions here, in government agencies, um, in all sorts of places. So obviously we've got, it's not because the people, the talent we've got in Australia is inward looking, it's just that we've got a combination of factors which keep us far too satisfied with mm. what we've got and don't see the longer term cost if we don't change some of these things. I just one, one last question before we um, move on, just to do with growth. Uh, a lot of the growth argument that you put forward, you can say that perhaps the Australian economy has been growing, I think, at around 1.7, 1.8%, but population growth in, in Australia has actually been greater than that, around uh, 2%. So just just wanting uh, just your thoughts on you know is the government doing everything that it could do to really drive growth when you have these kinds of figures or what what do you think should be done to improve that? Uh, I, th I think there's plenty. That <laughs> How far do I risk my hand here? <laughs> there's plenty that can be done. There's a productivity um, commission report about the way to increase productivity in the economy. Um, there are programs in place, um, some quite small, but, 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 but other things as well. I mean, a, a small thing, of course, is the landing pad, which is bringing um, startups here to Singapore and a number of other places around the globe. It's a small program, but it's actually working quite well. And now we need to build on that. I'd like to build on that with scale-ups and SMEs, innovative or export SMEs, to bring them here and to bring other places. Um, uh, the government hasn't been able to bite the bullet on tax changes. I think ways to increase investment in corporations is quite important. But I think there's a lot of more work that needs to be done on signalling, particularly with boards and their approach to growth. One thing I'm personally very happy to see is uh, our capital position has changed and we're seeing more of the super funds look at opportunities up here. I think that's a very positive thing for us. Too often the super funds have where they have invested offshore in, in Asia, for instance, they've put one investment in, waited for it to mature, and then said, that, that's good, I've made a little bit of money, bring it back to Australia. So there's no one up here that says, right, 10% of our allocation has to be expended in Asia, let's build on that over the next 20 years. And I think, I really do think we need to start thinking about that. We've got a lot of super funds that are tied up uh, in Australia, and we need to be bringing more of that capital to this part of the world and building a, a better environment, a better return for our businesses and a better environment for business overall. We can, we're, we're in a position to make a sizable contribution on that front. Okay, thanks Bruce. I think we're lucky also to have Ali uh, here today on the, on the panel. Um, I overheard uh, Ali being described as a serial entrepreneur. 
So uh, it's good to have that kind of uh, background uh, here today. So I was just wondering, you know, as someone that's involved, you know, in business like you are, what are some of the most critical investment decisions that you as a business owner uh, needs to, you know, bear in mind uh, before launching into, you know, international business operations? What are some of the things that, you know, come to your mind in that regard? Yeah, thank you for having me here. So you need to understand the markets. Mm -hmm. You have to first see if the opportunity, the idea that you have is viable in the market that you're planning to launch. Second, it is uh, the partnerships that you're going into and pitching the idea and why you are the right person to go with them. So in logistics, it's there are vast majority of um, companies that offer the services. But um, it's hard for, not hard, but it is a challenge to show them that this is a new concept, what we were doing. It's a new concept and, um, and they couldn't grasp it at, at that time. Then another one is around the regulations. So we spend money with, um, with experts who could help us understand the regulations of importing and exporting and seeing some, let's say, gray areas where it's not really clear. It depends on the interpretation of each person involved. So we had experts saying one thing and, and others saying another thing because of the same, even in the same paragraph. Um, but at the end of the day is definitely knowing the opportunity that is there and doing your market research and being part of the market helps a lot. And I mean, uh, dwelling on some of the, the policy things, uh, again, what, what do you think are some of the initiatives that you would like to see, you know, as, as a business owner, that you would want governments to sort of push that would help you grow your business and make your business more successful? I'm sure you've got some, some tips there. Transparency and logistics, definitely. They're the, the key things? Yes. Okay. Um, for exporters, definitely. And um, as we've seen, we've been looking for partners in a grocery industry that would understand our mission and vision, like our vision to disrupt it. Because there's a lot of wastage in the supermarkets nowadays. and. Um, and so we thought, okay, there's a lot of wastage and the produce that you get here is losing taste and it's losing its quality because it's hyper-frozen and pre-picked. So pre-picked and then hyper-frozen and then ripen through during transition. So my question was, why can't we get it direct? It's picked, well, for the local market, it's picked fresher, right? It's like about a week or two weeks before it goes onto the market. So why can't we get it across the border direct to Singapore, who has um, the need for imported goods? And that was the challenge that we had. So we went to several small producers, and um, they are very satisfied with their domestic um, income and, and success. And um, the way we were wanted to do it was um, API integrations and more of a technology innovation rather than going the traditional way. So um, s shortening overhead and operating as low as we can. So because we didn't have massive backup in um, in money, so we are self-funded so far. Okay, very good. Well, I've been I've been handed uh, some technology, and I'll try and uh, use this to the best of my ability. And I think it's important that we bring uh, bring the audience in, in here. We've got some really good questions that uh, I'll, I'll just ask the the panel in general, and you can fight over who wants to answer it. But maybe maybe this one um, could be yours, Ricardo. I think because it's. They're wanting to know a little bit more about how productivity plays into the findings of the study. How does productivity play into the findings of the study? Um, so 
When you look at the study, um, look, I, I was not an author of the study. I said, <coughs> I'm an outsider, although it's my, it's in my discipline. <laughs> so um, they looked at four outcomes. So they looked at what happens over time to casual employment. They looked at uh, what happened to permanent employment. They looked at profitability of the business, and they looked at uh, sales revenues. And what you saw is that, and I think what, what, what should be discussed here first is that um, it's great to have these questions and, and you want to do that research, but you need the data to be able to do it. And um, there haven't been many studies done in Australia, and one of the main reasons for that is because the data isn't there. Um, so, you know, if there's someone from the ABS here, <laughs> Um, let's get let's collect data. Um, so we have these four outcomes, and what we saw is that um, in the short run, if there is uh, overseas business expansion, you saw that the um, casual employment was affect negatively affected, but then there was a significant growth in sales revenues. So sales revenues, and obviously in the longer term, that is going to create employment. But because you need a much longer study to show that, we couldn't show that in this standard. Back to profitability. So the idea would be, the theoretical argument would be, if you, if you engage in, in export or in, in, in overseas business activity, as, as um, the panel members here said, is you, you know, that's a more competitive environment. So you are going to um, you know, raise your game. That's what you're going to do. So you would expect a prof um, profitability to go up as well. It is something we didn't find in this, in this, uh, in this report, but I, I, I still think that that's because the, the timeline wasn't large enough to actually uh, show those kind of effects. Okay. I'm just having a look as, uh, as you were answering at, uh, at some of the questions there, and a lot of them um, have Bruce's name on them. So Bruce, th this one here is an interesting uh, question. It says, uh, what detriment, if any, does the current volatile Australian political climate affect our ability to trade in the region? <laughs> uh, none. Um, well, I've been here two and a half years and I mix with a lot of business people, a lot of big investors, and no one has ever asked me that question. Um, mostly because they understand how the Australian market works and yeah. we have been growing for 27 years. Um, so uh, they might ask about Brexit, but they certainly don't ask about um, Australia. Um, can I just make a little comment sure. about um, data? Um, if people want to fund something really important, it could be um, ABS longitudinal surveys. Um, because this is a problem. I mean, the ABS has been so starved of, of funding it's not doing some um, important things. Now, we, we at Austrade, in partnership with the Export Council of Australia and EFIC, we started an annual survey with the intention of building up over a period of time something of a, of a, of a series of, um, of surveys of um, Australian companies, but we really need ABS to do this. Um, the numbers they can do is bigger, and, um, and we can't get um, frequent enough longitudinal studies of um, what's happening with the Australian export community and it's a it's an important thing it would be an important public resource and, uh, and, and a good guide to what we should be doing so if the Pratt Foundation wants to uh, help with that I'm sure it'd be very welcome very good uh, I mean, just, to, yeah. just, to, just to follow up on that I mean the, the data that we that the researchers used in this study was from 2006 to, two th to 2011. So there was a start of data collection, longitudinal data collection, and then they stopped. Uh, surely that's because of lack of money, but that was such a shame because you've started this beautiful data collection and you know, the value of it is only going to be bigger if you continue it, um, but it didn't happen. So there you go. Talking of research and data, I just want to, um, here's a question for, for Ben. Uh, with regards to some ANZ research, and I think it's obviously very relevant to what we're talking about, suggests that the profit margins of Australian businesses achieving in Asia are greater than what they achieve in their own uh, Asian operations. Why do you think that's the case? And just as a second point, these margins have been falling in recent years in, in global markets, and maybe why that might be the case as well. Okay. Um, so the survey we do is of 1,000 businesses, which I think would mainly classify as SME. Um, one of the other things that comes out of it is, as a region, 
more of those businesses are operating in ASEAN than in China. So I think the data, I was thinking about this when I was um, reading up again this morning, the data may be slightly skewed because of the smaller businesses. I think more large Australian businesses businesses are doing a lot more in China. Um, but when you talk to a lot of people about China, most people would say that, it, that there's, there's big parts of industries that are not making any money there. It's so competitive. And because we're dealing with more, uh, we're surveying more smaller companies or SMEs, which is, you know, as Bruce is saying, that's where the growth's going to come and exporters in, in, in the next wave of expansion. Those businesses have perhaps chosen to do less with China because there's not as much opportunity. And more in Southeast Asia because it's closer, it offers quite a diverse range of options depending on which markets you choose and perhaps there's slightly less competition so the, the profit opportunity is a bit better. Um, as to why it may have been declining, I, I think you'd need a longer trend mm -hmm. to, to establish anything uh, from that. Um, I thought it might have just been the fact that the markets have become more competitive themselves, you know, more yeah. people entering the market just, uh, you know, just naturally uh, forcing down margins. It, it could be. I mean, there can be fluctuations in exchange rates and all sorts of things. Australian product looks expensive one year and not so expensive the next. Um, but I mean, I, I, I'm still fascinated that 51% of these companies have a higher profit margin in, mm. in Asia than they do in Australia. That, um, that, that amazes me. Mm. And I couldn't really, I couldn't give you a reason as to why yeah. that would be. Not a, not a story that people would naturally think of or is told in Australia very often, I don't think. Right. I'll butt in because I can. Um, I, I don't think I don't think that um, Australians realise it's a funny economy. You could, you could say it's not competitive because Australia is largely an oligopoly economy, but you imagine being a small business in food in Australia. Who, who do you sell to? You sell to Coles or you sell to, or you sell to Woolies? Now, it's th that, the, the, margins, the margins for them are tiny. If you're, if you're a tech, if you're a, probably in a tech company, who, who are you going to sell to? You're going to sell to Telstra or you're going to sell to Optus? If I mean, you know, if if you're in um, if if you're in chemicals, you, 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 your your big your big customers are, you know, busy busy like busy like us busy like us. That's where your big volume is going to come from, and yeah, Amcor, which is now uh, Aurora, but um, that the margins the margins are small. If you come here, that you've got a diversified customer base, and the other thing is you won't get to the starting line. You will not get to the starting line in Asia unless you've already got competitive advantage. So, so, and if you've got competitive advantage in in uh, in Asia, you're going to be able to dictate your own price. Anyone want to add add to to that? No. Well, uh, how are we looking for time? Five minutes. Okay. Time for a couple of uh, good questions. There's a good question here actually on the alumni network, um, maybe you'd like to answer this one. How could Australia leverage on the massive alumni network in Asia when venturing overseas? So taking advantage of the uh, you know, graduates, Australian graduates. Anyone? Yeah, sure. Um, well, even in just a market like this, um, uh, there are 200,000 Australian alumni. Um, you know, 101 member of parliament, there are 16 Australian graduates. Um, there are three members of the cabinet who are alumni. So, I mean, universities tend to work quite hard in bringing their alumni together. Um, we tend to try and bring others together as well. The good thing about it, of course, is it's about a quality of an Australian education and the experience they have in Australia. It keeps contacts with Australia going and you leverage that in all sorts of ways, including young Singaporeans seeing what older Singaporeans with, a, with an education, with an Australian institution, how they have leveraged that, how their careers have been advanced by it. One question that just comes to mind then, and this is from a conversation that I had with uh, Jonathan uh, recently, he was talking about the actual capabilities of Australian students to be able to successfully go abroad and be good at, you know, doing their business based on where we stand uh, in terms of numeracy and literacy results. Do you think moving forward that, you know, Australian people 
graduates have the capabilities to be successful. Well, look at how many Aussies you've got here. Um, yeah, um, look, of course we do. I mean, there will always be debates about literacy and numeracy standards and all those sorts of things. But every economy is trying to inject more creativity, more problem solving, more resilience into their education system, not least Singapore because they know what you need. That's what you need nowadays. I was at a, an event a couple of nights ago where um, a woman who does all Facebook Apex recruitment was asked what she looks for. And she said that she looks for people who are responsible, professional, curious. And she's not interested in people with IT skills. She wants people who can take those sorts of qualities in a very diverse team-based environment and contribute. Now, I, I think Aussies are pretty good at that. Um, they've got those sorts of characteristics and the graduates of Australian universities have those sorts of characteristics and that's basically what employers want nowadays. Okay, excellent. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So just to add to that, I think education's an uh, example where not all exports are equal. So I think education is now Australia's third largest export, but it, it's essentially the gift that keeps on giving up here. So I, th I believe that question will be targeted at Asian student alumni coming back into these markets. Um, so 16% of the members of parliament, that we would at ANZ have at least that sort of percentage of alumni. And it's really important to us, not just in a market like Singapore, but across the, the Indonesias, Philippines, Vietnam, the, uh, Thailand, those kind of markets, because we're fundamentally an Australian business. And keeping that, and we're, and we're it's a, it's banking's ultimately a service, so it's people people driven, and keeping consistency and understanding of who we are, how we do things, what's normal for for an Australian business and com and companies that are expecting to deal with Australian business, is very difficult unless you have people that have experience with the culture and lived in the market and are used to dealing with people of that nature, and so that's great for our business, and I suspect there's many other Australian companies in the region that seek the same employees out but in fact sometimes we don't realize we're seeking them out they seek us mm. they like that they want to keep that connection too right no i agree um i think we've maybe got time for one last question anyone from the audience would like to ask a question at this stage if i haven't asked a question that you wanted asked, no well i think it's been a really fascinating uh, discussion here this afternoon i'd like to thank all of the panelists uh, for their time and for for their expertise and i hope that you, all of you have enjoyed um their answers so th thank you very much